Well, good afternoon. My name's Paul Welsh. I was once the chairman of Elster Studios and I act as its historian these days. Now I'm retired. I'm also chairman of Elster Screen Heritage, which is a body that celebrates the heritage of Borenwood and Elstree and its filmmaking and television making past. What is your role in relation to the studio? Well, nowadays it's really just acting as a historian because I'm one of the last men standing who remember much about its heritage and its history. Because I first went there in 1960 as a youngster uh, and have been involved with it ever since. And I've been writing a film column in several newspapers for 42 years about the studios and the productions made there. So they tend to reference me whenever anybody asks them anything about the history of the studios. Can you tell us a little about when the studio was first built and why? Well, it was built in 1926. It was um, only a hundred pound an acre in those days to land in Borenwood. So they bought 40 acres of land and they decided to build a what was then a silent film studio because they were still making silent films. Sound hadn't come into the equation at that point. And it was an adventure, really, I suppose, by businessmen to see if they could profit from the growing interest in cinema. But sadly, um, within a couple of years, the original owners had to bow out, and a man called John Maxwell, a Scottish man who owned cinemas, bought the facility because then he could make films and then he could distribute them and then ex exhibit them in his own cinema. So it made good sense from his point of view. And within only two or three years, of course, they had to convert them into sound production because sound had come in at the end of the 1920s and so though they were originally built as silent studios they had to be soundproofed slightly basically but they did it and they made the first talking film British talking film called Blackmail which was directed by Alfred Hitchcock and it's credited uh, some dis dispute it but it's credited as being the first British talking film so Elstree has always had a heritage of uh, pioneering days and especially in those early days. Could you tell us about some of the famous filmmakers who have used the studios over the years and why they choose to use L Street? Well, um, if you go back in the old days, you had people like John Huston directing Moby Dick. As I mentioned, Alfred Hitchcock, of course, worked there. A number of American and British directors worked at the studios. But I guess today's generation would think more about the Lucasfilm era, as we call it, which started in 1976 when George Lucas and Gary Kurtz decided to base Star Wars at Elstree. And that resulted in making another nine films there, which was the three original Star Wars and the three Indiana Jones films, the original ones, and other productions. So for about 10 years, it was known as Lucasland, really. Lucas took to it because he could get a studio that he could really control, really. When they came in, they virtually took over the whole site, and that meant they had a great control over the production, and everything was quite close to each other. If you go to Hollywood, like Universal Studios or somewhere, you find you have to get go-karts to go around to different places. Everything is, is spread out, but Elstree was very compact, and it actually was cheap for them as well, so that was another deciding factor that they could produce the film in Britain much cheaper than they could make it in Hollywood. But once they'd come with Star Wars, they grew to like the facilities, and naturally they would return to make the sequels and the Indiana Jones pictures. So I, I guess uh, Ron Howard, of course, directed Willow there, and he, he went on to international fame, and there's a lot of other directors who worked at Elstree, and it's um, had a world, well, yeah, yeah, really a worldwide reputation, I think. Uh, I don't think outside of Hollywood anywhere could boast as many famous people having worked at the place. Could you tell us a little about how the studios were saved from being demolished and how this was achieved? Well, we, uh, it's, I was chairman of that campaign. Uh, we started in 1988. It was owned by a company called Canon Films, who had bought it from Thorn EMI, including its film library and cinema chain. But they ran into financial difficulties fairly quickly, so they sold off the library of films in 1987. And then in 1988, they decided to sell off the studio. But basically, even though it was profit-making, they, they were basically putting on the market for anybody, redevelopment or whatever. Uh, and a company called Brent Walker stepped into the equation and decided they would rebuild Elstree if they were allowed to sell 12 acres of the land to Tesco's. 
retaining the other 15 acres and rebuilding it, and they entered into a planning agreement with the, with the council to that effect. So, sadly, we had to agree with that because there were no other offers, so there was no other choice, really. But Brent Walker then also ran into financial difficulties, and by 1990, they were basically being run by the banks that they owed a huge amount of money to, and the banks were not interested in running a film studio. So we had a campaign that lasted eight years to try and save it, and eventually it closed in 1993, but we carried on fighting, and then in 1996, we luckily struck gold when they fouled into court actions, and uh, it, the judgment was looking iffy. We didn't know whether we win or not, but they decided to bow out and sell it to the Borough Council, Hartsmere Council, for a real knockdown price, just to get away from all the bad publicity and press the banks were getting from this particular issue. So in 1996, Hartsmere Borough Council bought the site for under £2 million. And if you think the 12 acres they sold to Tesco's eight years earlier went for uh, 19 million. So Hartsmere got a bargain buying 15 acres, albeit we then had to spend 10 million pounds refurbishing the site. And I was chairman of the studio at that point from 96 to 2000, and we built two new big sound stages, which we needed to do. So, and ever since the place has really prospered and uh, it's now regenerating back into the public purse about two million pounds a year which means every resident in the whole of the borough, not just Elstree and Borenwood, but Potter's Bar, Radlett, Shenley, Bushy, etc., they all have their rates down by 20% because the council are getting the revenue from the studios. So it proved a very successful campaign, and now the studio is overbooked. It's so busy that they're not... We're having to, well, I say we, I'm not really involved now, but they're having to look at building additional sound stages to cope with the work. So it was a long eight-year fight, but I think it was, with all the public support we got, et cetera, was worth doing. What films or TV programmes were filmed at Elstree Studios today? Well, today, well, I'm slightly out of touch, but they do things like The Chase there, and um, there's an afternoon programme, um, which uh, has totally gone out of my mind now. Strictly to Come Dancing, of course, is a big success at Elstree. And they moved there, the BBC moved into the site, and I'm very happy with that facility, so that seems to be staying. Um, uh, but there's a number of productions, TV productions. The Crown, of course, a big American production, one of the most expensive in television history, has been using the facility as well, and the backlot area, which is now being cleared, and so they can build big external sets on the backlot. So it's being used by television, but it's also being used by films. But we need to grow the capacity a bit so that We've had to turn away people like Spielberg and so on for lack of room, which is sad, and it shows there is a need for increased facilities on the site. How do you see the studios developing in the future? Well, I would hope to see it develop in the sense, as I mentioned earlier, on the back lot area, which is about three or four acres, to build another two sound stages that could accommodate big productions that would give us a good position in, in the whole scheme of life. Borenwood is very central for filmmakers. It's very useful for them. It's very easy for the crew and and stars who are being in hotels in London to get down here very very quickly. Audience shows, it's very easy, it's very accessible with a main rail station going into London. So it ticks a lot of boxes for a lot of people. So Elstree, I think, has got a great future and it's got a name as well, which is the other bit you can't buy. You can build a new studio, but you can't buy heritage and you can't buy name value. And Elstree is known throughout the world, which is great because it's been there a long time and it deserves that future. So I, I'm optimistic. I think we're going to see uh, good times ahead. Well, thank you. Well, thank you for inviting me to speak. Thank you very much. <laughs>